Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for being brave souls to listen to an HPC presentation Thursday morning in Vegas. <laughs> uh, but hopefully this will be interesting enough and worth your time. I'm uh, Tosh Tambe. I'm with Amazon Web Services. I manage our strategic alliances in the design engineering space and HPC uh, broadly. Um, we also have Judd Kaiser here from ANSYS, and he is the program manager for their uh, cloud computing uh, business. So between the two of us, hopefully today we will be able to share some interesting uh, ways in which you can do HPC on AWS. Uh, we, will look at, um, we'll, we will look at it from the uh, perspective of uh, engineering simulation, or CAE, That'll be our window into HPC on AWS. But you'll, you'll hopefully see that uh, things we talk about can be applied a little more broadly as well to HPC on AWS. So that's the, the goal of this session. Um, we'll, you know, we'll look at some of the challenges that exist with HPC on AWS, or HPC in general, but also with HPC in the cloud and on AWS, and uh, how you can get around some of these challenges. And Judd will share uh, more specifically on how ANSYS uh, solve some of these problems and how they enable their customers to do HPC and CAE on, on AWS with their solution. So the, the goal of this um, session, it's again, it's, I would say it's kind of introductory to intermediate as such. So you don't need to have a, a deep knowledge of HPC uh, at all. We, we'll, we'll start off with some very basic uh, stuff. But hopefully, we'll get to um, some tips and tricks if you are an HPC user or HPC uh, user on a AWS. So it'll be valuable, I think, you know, if you're very new to HPC or if you've spent some time with HPC, hopefully. And, and we can, uh, after the session, chat in more detail if there's a specific thing with what you're trying that uh, we, we can help you guys with. Uh, actually, a quick show of hands. How many here use HPC in, so high performance computing in some degree? That's a, okay, that's a decent number, thank you. Um, how many of you are from the design engineering or manufacturing space? All right, that's a good number, okay. Uh, and how many of you have done any HPC work or deployed any HPC workloads on AWS? Okay, we have a few. That's actually more than I was expecting, so that's, that's great. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna do is actually start off uh, with, we, we've got a bunch of folks here from the engineering design space, so this is something you guys know uh, very well. But I just want to give a little bit of a background so that we are level set on what we're talking about here with uh, uh, CAE or engineering simulation and specifically answers a solution later on. Uh, but the design and engineering process in, in, a, in a very high level uh, form at least follows this um, these, these stages as such, where you start out a product, if it's a brand new product, with, a, with conceptual design. So let's take a car, for example. You start with, with a conceptual design of the car. There's some iteration on that, but that gets into more of a, a formal engineering design process, which includes uh, you know, what's called computer-aided design, or CAD, which is engineering design to take this concept into more of a, a, a true uh, model or, or, or a design with you know structural elements and all of that. Uh, then this design, this uh, this data that's built in a CAD system, is taken through some simulation, engineering simulation, which is CAE or computer computer aided engineering. And this is where you essentially are simulating real world phenomena in digital form uh, to to make sure that the product that you're designing can actually withstand uh, the the demands that are going to be put on it in the real world. So that's actually going to be a a large part of what we uh, talk about, or the workload that we talk about today, is, is a engineering simulation or a CAE workload. And then there's this tooling design that's also involved, which is commonly called a CAM, or computer-aided uh, machining. And that's basically taking that design and seeing how you can actually manufacture it. And there's some design uh, that happens around it. Uh, and this, not necessarily in, in this tight loop, but it's an iterative process, and really the goal here for many companies is to try to, as, try to have as many iterations in the, in the digital form of the design before they take it into physical form, because as soon as you take it to physical form, it gets, it gets expensive. So the more simulations you can run, 
in digital form, higher confidence you have in the design and uh, a better design that you have in the end. Then finally goes to production. So that's, that's the uh, very high level uh, process. And this engineering design uh, or, or simulation, CAE, it takes various different forms. So here's an example with uh, various simulations in digital form being done on uh, uh, car components and, and, and uh, chassis. So the first one on the top left is um, called, you know, it's FEA. It's, it's basically stress strain. You put a load on it, how does it behave? For example, on a piston. The second one's uh, thermal uh, simulation, so heat dissipation and stuff inside an engine. Uh, the one top right is uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. It's, you know, how fluid flows through uh, systems, in this case, through ports and valves uh, inside a car engine. Then on the bottom left, you've got crash simulation. On the right, you've got uh, electromagnetic uh, field simulation, which actually looks a little scary. That's what you sit in in your car. But uh, anyway, but that, <laughs> so there's, there's all these different domains of physic, physical phenomena that uh, these workloads try to uh, emulate or simulate uh, in, in digital form. And very often it's, it's a mix of multiple domains that actually gets you to optimum design because there might be an interaction between uh, thermal load and physical load that actually affects the system in, in, in the real world. So that's, that's, that's quickly an overview of the, the problem space or the problem domain here for, this, uh, for CAE workloads. Um, and then for that, this is a very crude high level uh, architecture or anatomy of a CA solution, but uh, it, it's a very typical HPC solution in general. Uh, so even if you're not from uh, the engineering space or do CAE, this HPC uh, diagram will, will uh, look very familiar to you. So you know, typically on the client side, you've got uh, a way to either set up your simulation or study analysis as some interactive uh, work that you do. You have some cache data and then you send that study off to uh, run uh, the simulation, which is a batch process, which you see on the server side, where there's a, a data repository, and from that, uh, you, you, you pull data out and then basically run jobs. So you have a, a job manager as such, and then you've got jobs running on, on compute uh, infrastructure. Right? So that's a, it's a very basic architecture for CAE, but also applies to others. And also there's an identity and access piece there, because you know, not everyone in the organization has access to this. So it's pretty fundamental. Um, but has, although simple, it has implications in terms of how you can take the system from on, uh, your on-premises deployment to the cloud. And you'll see some of that in what Judd will share with you in a few minutes. And another aspect to HPC workloads, which is also important because not all HPC workloads are the same, so I wanted to point out that there's, there's primarily two axes on which you can uh, bucketize HPC workloads. And one axis is that of, uh, which is the, the Y axis here, is that of how tightly coupled these workloads are or they run. And what that re really means is how much of inter-process communication happens when you send jobs out. Do these jobs run completely independent of each other or there is some cross-process communication that's required to process the job completely. Uh, so you have some loosely coupled jobs, you know, typically like uh, animation or rendering is, is, a, is a loosely coupled uh, HPC job. Uh, and then tightly coupled, CAE is an example of a tightly coupled job. And the x-axis is data, uh, the size of data involved, in, not the storage side, but actually the uh, you know, active work in progress data that's involved. And uh, the CAE workloads tend to be on the light side. And even, by light, I still mean gigabytes of data. Uh, usually, but not petabytes. Like, you know, um, seismic uh, simulations, for example, are very large petabyte size uh, data. So the architecture of an HPC system will, will change a little bit uh, based on some of these aspects. And the kinds of infrastructure or instances that you use underneath will also change based on what kind of a workload it is. So what we are going to look at today is a, a CAE workload, which is essentially a, a relatively light, data light and a tightly coupled workload. <clears throat> so having said that, I, I want to also share what HPC means to the end uh, customers, the end users of, uh, 
of HPC, uh, and why it's important, one, for them to run as much of CAE as possible, but also why it's important for them and has become, is becoming more and more important for them to uh, have more flexibility in infrastructure and move to the cloud. So here's, you know, uh, I've taken an example here, uh, Toyota's uh, philosophy on design and engineering, but many other companies follow a similar philosophy. And what, uh, what this diagram is trying to differentiate between is, on the left-hand side is a traditional, what's called a point-based approach to design. And what that essentially does is it, it, you start with a, an idea, or maybe a couple of ideas, and then you take them through that iterative process that I shared earlier uh, to create your design, so uh, CAD, CAE, CAM, et cetera. And you essentially refine that design as it goes. But the, the fundamental issue with that is you might have a highly refined bad idea, because if you start with the wrong choice, you've got a highly refined idea, but it might not be the, the optimal design. So what is ideal is to actually have the ability to run as many ideas, as many concepts as possible through as many stages of the design process. And through gating factors, allow some ideas to basically die natural deaths and have the, the, the strongest, most robust ideas make it through to the end. And so you have the most optimal design options in the end. So to be able to do that, you can imagine you need as much elbow room as you can possibly have. You need to be able to run as many studies as you need to run within that possible design space. And that's where um, designers, engineers, uh, folks in the manufacturing space who use CAE have started seeing the value of the cloud because when they need to have large-scale simulations being run in parallel, it is incredibly expensive to own your own infrastructure to do that, especially because your design cycle uh, requires this simulation not necessarily for 12 months of the year, uh, but when you need it, it it's, it's a critical part of your design process. So that flexibility to scale very broadly is, is one of the key uh, values that this industry is seeing in the cloud, and hence many of our uh, uh, partners in this space are, are uh, taking their solutions to the cloud. But it's not always easy, and that's where Jared will share how Ansys, with this demand from their users, uh, was able to re-engineer their solution to run uh, efficiently on AWS, and some of the challenges therein and how they, how, how they got around that. So let me actually have Jared take it from here. Thanks, Jared. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Ansys, we're a very traditional engineering software company that serves the engineering community's demands for simulation. Uh, we started roughly 40 years ago, focused initially on finite element analysis, structural mechanics, and we've grown over the years into fluid mechanics, electromagnetics, chip and package simulation, system simulation, and now even embedded software. Uh, so the chances are, if you have a product you use, the car you own, the plane you flew here in, uh, the cell phone you'll be playing with if I bore you. Ansys products certainly could have been and very probably were used in the design of those products in the very early stages. Um, if you go back even 10 years, engineering simulation was the purview of specialists. You had a PhD in a particular field and you would likely focus on a single physics. You would be a fluids expert or a mechanical expert or an electromagnetics expert. Um, but we've seen certain trends over the course of recent years, and one has been a trend to understand products in the digital space, as Tosh said, in, in real-world operating conditions, taking into effect the accounts of multiple physics. And not just components in isolation, but now entire you know, assemblies of complex products or even systems that, that interact with software, electronics, and, and 3D physics and understanding how they behave, not just at single operating points, not at just that, that ideal operating condition, but how they, how they behave over their entire range of operating space, or how they respond to uh, uncertainties in those in, in input parameters. And then finally, the idea is that we're gonna extend all of this complex capability, not just to the realm of, of specialists in one physics, but deploy it broadly across. You know, the vision for our company is absolutely that every engineer will be using uh, simulation products in one form or another. Now, ANSYS has grown over the last 40 years, both organically and by acquisition, making strategic acquisitions of other uh, physics simulation products. Um, I'm actually a, a product of that. Uh, in my 21-year career, I've worked for two companies, 
and Ansys bought both of them. So I've, I've stopped trying to leave. <laughs> uh, in order to succeed in that, you know, acquire different, di previously disconnected products in physics and deliver them in a cohesive way that solves these multi-physics challenges, you have to have a platform strategy. And, you know, traditionally we run on the engineering desktop. We have a big space heater that sits under our desk, uh, you know, an engineering workstation, and, and these products are integrated at the workstation desktop level in ANSYS Workbench. It's a software platform that's enabled us to integrate these third-party tools and string them together in a way that allows automation. So even though I'm using multiple tools and involving multiple physics, once I've worked through a, pro a problem once, I can parameterize it and investigate multiple design alternatives. So that's at the desktop level. Now, obviously over time we've grown beyond the desktop. You know, uh, on-premise infrastructure today, the, the normal course of engineering for our large customers is they still use that desktop workstation for some of their local use, but then they're spinning off their heavy compute jobs to an in-house HPC data center. And they have a queuing system that sits in front of that data center whose job is to keep all those cores in the data center busy all the time, which means the engineers are waiting in line. Um, and as you grow from individual engineers working on their own problems on their own desktop to m managing uh, simulation across the enterprise and accessing centralized resources, you start to need tools to do the HPC orchestration, a centralized way for the engineers to manage their data so the organizations maintain ownership, control of that data, and they can leverage it for reuse, you know, protect and reuse that intellectual property. And we have an on-premise solution for that called ANSYS EKM. Now, as you can imagine, multiple physics, multiple design variants, um, you know, our, our problem sizes are routinely quite large. You know, our, our customers commonly simulate with thousands of cores for individual jobs. Uh, so obviously our, our customers are quite resource hungry. Uh, and that obviously provides a logical push to the cloud. Our customers are coming to us and say, how can we take advantage of this new resource, this new cloud computing? Um, and when they come to me and say, hey, I want to I do ANSYS on the cloud, uh, they might be targeting one of several use cases. You know, one, and this is more internal focus, this is us that wants to do this, we would like to make it easy for our customers to immediately be able to try and use software. Click a button in the browser and all of a sudden you're using one of our products in the browser. Uh, that's something we're doing now with a, a partner company called Frame, just as kind of a side thing. But really it, it's, and the other thing people come to us at, at the entry level of the market and they say, hey, I, I really can't afford to buy a big workstation and buy a license of ANSYS all the time. I'd like to pay by the drink, buy by the hour, and have a software as a service model. Um, I'm not here, really here to talk about that today. That's something we're working on behind the scenes. But from an HPC perspective, it's that hunger for cores that really is the primary driver to cloud. And the first thing they come to me and ask and say, hey, I want to do burst to the cloud. For those times when my data center isn't big enough, my job's too big, or it's too backlogged, my wake lines are too long, I want to burst to the cloud. Well, the problem with burst to the cloud is you end up with a data transfer problem. Right? Okay, I'm going to send up an input file. That's not too big. That's typically on the order of megabytes to gigabytes, uh, small numbers of gigabytes, but then I'm gonna run these simulations, which are potentially huge, and certainly tens of gigabytes are common, hundreds of gigabytes are not uncommon, and even terabyte size simulation files happen, and if I'm gonna transfer that back for analysis, I've got a, I've got a real bottleneck. Um, an extension of that is cloud for short-term projects. I got a group who wants to use the cloud for a few months because we don't have resources. That's a little bit better than the burst to the cloud in terms of you keep your data there for a while, but then you have to archive it when you're done. What we really targeted initially, and what I'm really here to talk to you about today, is this enterprise cloud for end-to-end -end engineering simulation. I want some of our customers want to get out of the business of building data centers. I'd just like to do all of the simulation in the cloud, end-to-end -end engineering simulation in the cloud, and it avoids that data transfer problem that gives me access to you know, virtually infinite resources. And I, I don't really know what Infor does, to be honest with you, I've tried to figure it out a couple of times but they're really good for quotes for the cloud. And one of my favorite ones is, friends don't let friends build data centers. And I think that's becoming increasingly, increasingly true. So we want to be your friend and we don't want you to build a data center. And we want to enable you to do end-to-end -end engineering simulation in the cloud. So this is kind of the first thing we tackled. And we're new to this cloud space. You know, this is, we're in a 200 session because we still don't know that much. Um, <laughs> but we're working on it. Uh, and what we've delivered over the course of the last year, working pretty intensively in partnership with Amazon and a couple of key technology partners, is we've delivered this ANSYS Enterprise Cloud Platform. 
And again, the idea is do everything in the cloud. So it's a complete engineered system that we deploy in, a, in the customer's AWS account. So it's not a multi-tenant solution that we host. We deploy this in your account. But it's all pre-engineered. It comes with a working auto-scaling HPC cluster. That's kind of the center of the system. That's what people want to allow them to scale up HPC jobs on demand, grab the resources they need when they need them, and then shut them down. In order to facilitate that, we have uh, systems for managing both your archive and your work in progress data. Uh, and we're using a, you know, a high-speed parallel file system that's been carefully optimized to communicate with all of the instances it needs to, uh, for both for HPC and for interactive use. If, if I'm going to do everything in the cloud, and I'm not going to bring the data back to solve that data transfer problem, I need to be able to work with it completely, interactively, just like I would on my desktop. Mesh generation, pre-processing, post-processing, spin the 3D model. And to do that, I need access to a GPU to get good graphics performance. And then I'm just going to stream the pixels back to my desktop. And my window into this whole environment is just a web UI that we call the ANSYS Cloud Gateway. It's where you manage your data and you manage the jobs that are running. Uh, and uh, you, you launch these interactive sessions that you're going to use for pre- and post-processing. Um, and actually, I want to go back for a second. Uh, Infor is, is a fountain of wonderful quotes. And they gave another one in that, in that partner workshop. And that was, the, uh, and it applies well in Vegas. And that's what happens in the cloud stays in the cloud. And that applies very well here. That's the idea. It's do the whole thing in, in the cloud. So some of the key challenges we have, OK, well, we've, got a, we've got an engineer system that's a very different way of doing job scheduling that we're used to. As I said, we're used to a fixed number of cores that engineers stand in line and wait for theirs to be available, and then they run. HPC com uh, compute in the cloud is different, so we've partnered to solve that problem. We need a good solution for streaming those interactive pixels back to the end user and the client. We've partnered with a solution partner for that as well. Uh, we need a, a holistic solution for data management. We're going to manage the, the data that's, that's work in progress. We want a, a good solution for archival and backup. Uh, we want um, a relational database so we can search and find and reuse uh, the data that's in the system. And then finally, that it's an engineered environment. And one of the nice things about AWS is it makes it very easy to deploy automatically. It's very easy for me to spin up this whole data center in a customer account in a matter of hours. And, and how we do that deployment is an important component of the solution. So with that, I'm going to kind of hand the mic back to Tosh for a minute. And he can talk a little bit about kind of some of the underlying infrastructure, the building blocks that we've used to deliver this solution. All right, thanks, Joe. I'll let Judd take a small break, and I'll, uh, I'll just speak to some of the building blocks here, and then Judd's going to talk about how they put these building blocks together to build an HPC solution. So the first, uh, the first aspect that Judd spoke to was, you know, how do you do scale-out computing in the cloud? And the very basic building block is an EC2 instance, as you guys probably know. Um, but what's important here is to pick the right instance to run your workload. And it, it actually sounds easier than it is, because if you, if you start with the wrong instance type, the, the, the cost of building an architecture around a, a suboptimal instance can end up becoming a, a very expensive uh, project. So uh, I recommend uh, folks who are starting out on this uh, journey to spend a significant amount of time trying to figure out how their workload actually maps to the right instance families um, and types within, within EC2. So here's a list of uh, some of our uh, instance families. You've got you know, uh, general purpose ones. We've got compute optimized, memory optimized, um, IO optimized, and GPU micro. So these are all these different families. Not all of these are ideal for HPC. So you know, one of the things which, you know, if you're interested in getting your workload onto AWS and HPC workload onto AWS, one of the things that I would uh, ask you to do is you know, work with uh, an HPC expert within AWS to make sure that you, you start out with the right instances. And we are, we are here to help. And, and just a quick taxonomy. I'm sure most of you guys know this, but a quick uh, taxonomy of what, what these instance names mean. Uh, and it's pretty simple. You know, it starts out with an instance family. And that usually uh, indicates to uh, what, what kind of uh, optimization has been done for an instance. So C, for example, stands for compute optimized instances. 
so in that C family, you got generations based on the underlying compute platform. So C4, for example, is based on the Intel Haswell platform. We also have other Intel platforms available. And then within that, what is the size of the instance? So how many uh, virtual CPUs do you have? How much memory is, is, is uh, available on the instance? You know, what kind of uh, I.O. is available? All that uh, is, is determined by the instance size. So the way, the easiest way to figure out what's the right instance for you, because you actually might need multiple instances to build the entire HPC stack, as you will see uh, uh, Jared explain uh, for ANSYS. But you need to start off with thinking, you know, wh what optimization do I need for that part of the workload? So if it's, co it's compute that's intensive in that part of the workload, then you start with a C family, the right platform, and then the right size of the instance. And there's, there's a number of factors that, that truly affect H the, the performance of HPC uh, on, on AWS. And the first, obviously, is, is that underlying platform. Uh, and very often, you'll see that uh, workloads uh, have already been optimized for certain Intel platforms uh, on premise. And so that's, that's, a, that's a quick, easy way to start off. Uh, you, so, so for example, we've got three generations or three families of Intel processors available, uh, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, and now Haswell. Uh, and, and you can start with what you currently are optimized to run on-premise. One, one interesting thing about uh, the C4 uh, processor is uh, Intel actually designed a special SKU specifically for AWS uh, because the, the way we run this instance, the scale at which we run, requires uh, some interesting changes uh, in, in, in design that, that are not available on-premise. So it's a, it's a special Haswell instance at C4, but it comes with uh, you know, uh, up to 36 uh, virtual CPUs and up to 60 uh, uh, gigabytes of RAM, and uh, it's optimized for IOPS, or is available for uh, op optimized IOPS. It also comes with AVX2 uh, uh, vector uh, programming interface. So, so that's an example of a, a, a very popular instance for doing HPC, a compute in intensive part of HPC. And then the, 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 the other building block is the, the networking that's, that's used with those instances. Um, so one of the things you might know but I want to emphasize is that uh, AWS actually has its own proprietary 10 gig networking technology. Uh, and the reason for that is at, at the scale at which we operate, we, we need proprietary networking to actually make it work. Um, and within that, what we have is this concept of a placement group, which once you create your instances and place them within a placement group, they are physically located so that uh, the number of hops is essentially reduced. So, you, so when you're doing HPC, it's critically important that you use the placement groups functionality within uh, AWS networking. The other aspect is uh, enhanced networking, which is available on certain kinds of instances. And it, absolutely for HPC, you, you need to make sure that you, the, the instance that you choose has enhanced networking available on it, and that you choose enhanced networking when you uh, deploy that instance. So those are the, uh, the two main building blocks. And now, Jed is going to share how they actually put these building blocks together, how they made choices on instances, and uh, maybe some thoughts on networking as well. Thanks, Tosh. So like I said, the, the kind of the central component of interest for the whole solution is really this auto-scaling HPC. I mean, that's really fundamentally why people came to the cloud. They want to be able, they want to, be able to scale out and use very large numbers of cores for very large numbers of jobs on demand. Um, and as I said, we're fairly new to all this, and so we chose to partner with a company called Cycle Computing. Now, Cycle specializes in doing just this. They specialize in HPC on AWS. Um, and in truth, they probably specialize more in um, massively or embarrassingly parallel runs, jobs that don't, you know, don't interconnect, don't talk to each other too much. And, and the challenge we have is that our jobs are almost all MPI workloads. So when we run on large numbers of cores, there's a lot of inter-process communication that's happening on that network back end. So network performance is, is critical to us. Um, so that, that, you know, as Tosh said, that means we have to be very careful to make sure we're using the right instance types that do enable uh, that the enhanced networking capability. You have to put them in placement groups so you get the 
minimal inter-process communication latency. Um, and you need to use the right size instances because actually the network bandwidth that you actually achieve um, is, is throttled a bit depending on your instance size. So engineering the system requires care. And, and thankfully, Cycle has a lot of expertise and brought that care to the, to the table for us. Uh, and they're what, what provides the ability for us to, to scale on demand. And I, I, I keep using the word the HPC cluster as a singular. But in fact, it's HPC clusters. You know, we run many different types of core solvers under the hood. Like I said, we, we have you know, structural mechanics and fluid mechanics and electromagnetics, and each of those solvers actually uh, has different performance characteristics and different requirements. And one of, the, one of the beautiful things about the cloud is that we can actually configure multiple compu compute queues that are optimized for the particular solver. So we use a compute optimized instance for the fluid mechanics solver because it's, it's, that, it's the CPU performance and inter-process communication that dominates. Uh, for the mechanical solver, uh, we use actually the high memory instance types, the R family, 8x largest, um, to get 244 gigabytes per node. Each node has 16 real cores because the mechanical solver wants more gigabytes per core. Right? So the ability to optimize per solver and have multiple queues um, and spin up the right resources is actually a real advantage because the alternative tends to be in-house data centers, which are typically configured for one workload, right? So what, what we have commonly is, is customers on-premise running on poorly fit clusters for at least a portion of their jobs. Um, Cycle Cloud is the software solution that's embedded in the ANSYS Enterprise Cloud solution that orchestrates all of this. So they're what do the provisioning. When you submit a job, there's a job scheduler that's built into the system that recognizes whether or not there are resources available and provisions new resources if there aren't. Uh, Cycle is capable of taking advantage of spot pricing. I feel like I have to comment on this, but we haven't done that yet. This is my big uh, thing. Most, I'm, I'm most anxious to do in our next version is start to take advantage of spot instance pricing. Why didn't we do it initially? Well, actually, our jobs aren't very well suited to spot, at least as it was defined when we started. Actually, there's some announcements yesterday that should make it better for us, that make Spot more attractive. Because the problem we have is we, we might submit on 256 cores, you know, 16 nodes, and if one of those goes away because our Spot bid price got too low, uh, the whole job is dead. And, and those jobs can run for, in some cases, days. Right? So you can lose a lot of cost with a lost instance, but we'll, we'll work on that. Um, the configuration of those instances when they're provisioned is done using Chef uh, under the hood in Cycle. Um, there is, the Cycle Cloud provides a web UI that we, we don't show to users, but we provide to administrators, you know, the guys who need to look over the system. Remember, this is still the customer's data center. It's in their AWS account. So we, Cycle provides dashboards that allow the, the administrator to get a sense of the health of the system. You know, how is the auto scaling working? Check, track jobs. Are there failures in instance startups? Um, that's all available within the Cycle Cloud web UI which administrators can see, error handling, and then tear down. You know, when the, when the job is done and the instance is no longer used, take it out of, take it out of the queue uh, and provide some usage tracking mechanisms. So Cycle provides all of that kind of under the hood as part of the system for us. Now, kind of the elephant in the room for anybody who's, who's an HPC guru uh, and running, uh, you know, true high-performance workloads with ANSYS software is, is often 10 gig networking. They'll say, I can't do real HPC on AWS because you're limited to 10 gig networking. I, I, you know, I, I need thousands of cores. I must have you know, an InfiniBand network backend, or you know, I run tens of thousands of cores and I need a Cray. And that's actually still true. I, would, you know, I, I won't lie. That 10 gig is a, is a limiting performance factor. But let's put it into perspective. Limit you to what? You know, tests show with our, with our CFD solver scale very effectively up to 256 cores, and, and, and on larger problems, even up to 512 cores. So that means you're using sort of 16 to 32 nodes, you know, each of which has 16 real cores and 60 gig or 244 gig of RAM. These are still huge problems. They represent the overwhelming majority of the kinds of solutions our customers are actually running on a regular basis. Even our biggest customers, like take GE, they have a Cray. They do run jobs that are 5,000 cores. They're still interested in AWS because it can take those you know, daily workloads that do fit in 256 cores and run them on AWS. So 
The point is you can solve real problems. It does service, it does serve well the vast majority of our customer base. And the real beauty is as many of them as you want. Right? So our customers are increasingly interested in not just single operating points, but doing design optimizations and parametric runs, where you're running thousands of variations of the same problem, and you can run as many of them as you want simultaneously. And that allows scale out to really large scale. Interactive graphics, these other kind of key technology underpinning that we're dealing with here. Like I said, what happens in the cloud stays in the cloud. And in order to achieve that, you've got to be able to work with it interactively. Engineers must be able to click, spin, and see what they're working with. Uh, and interactive graphics is a necessary component of that. And again, probably one of the reasons why, I mean, there's many reasons why we chose Amazon, but one, one of the key ones was actually the availability of GPU instance types, GPU-enabled instance types, in multiple regions worldwide, because we're a worldwide company. Um, so the availability of NVIDIA GPUs in the, in, we use the G2 instance family, a G2 instance type in EC2 was, was a critical component of us. We actually do use GPUs for both graphics and compute. This slide kind of emphasizes the performance games you can get by GP, GPU, acceleration of compute. We do that. To date, we haven't done it in the cloud. Our focused use of GPUs in the cloud has really been to provide graphics capability. Um, actually, the economies of using GP, GPUs in the cloud don't really add up. They're, they're, they're accelerators. Um, we can just throw more cores at it uh, at lower cost anyway. So the availability of the G2 instance type was, was a critical enabler, but there's, there was one big flaw in the system for us, and that was the G2s come with 15 gigs of RAM, which is actually not sufficient for our heavy-duty pre- and post-processing needs. What our engineers commonly work with interactively are engineering workstations that, that have you know, potentially hundreds of gig, gigs of RAM. And so what we've been able to do is combine two instance types. We've partnered with a partner company called Nice Software. They have a product called DCV that Ansys has worked with for many years, desktop cloud visualization. It's a, a desktop client and a server side that allows you to stream the pixels from the server to the, the, thin, the lightweight client that's running on the desktop. Uh, it's been well certified. But the real key enabler for us for a, from a cloud basis is they have something, a capability they call remote rendering. So what that comes down to is, you know, you're faced with this choice. Well, I'd like to have a machine with large memory, or I'd like to have a machine with GPU. We really need both. And NICE actually enables that. So what we do is we run the interactive component of the software is actually running on the top right on an R3, a memory-optimized instance family. So that means I can deliver a desktop workstation with up to 244 gig of RAM. And the 2D rendering is done on that desktop. So the, you know, the buttons in your UI are streamed from there. But DCV captures the OpenGL calls for the 3D graphics, offloads those to a separate G2 instance, and the rendering is done there. And the, and the DCV stream for the 3D graphics comes back to the user that way. And they actually take advantage of economies of scale. You can have multiple application servers using a single rendering server. Um, so you may get maybe four users using the same rendering server uh, for interactive sessions before you start to see some performance degradation. And then we stream the pixels all back to the desktop. Uh, this diagram shows this using a proxy server. That's an optional component of the system. You could street, stream through standard uh, TCP ports. But that means you've got to go to your firewall team and get those ports opened up. Going through uh, a, a proxy server allows us to just go over HTTPS and lightens the IT footprint. Um, and th the nice thing about the cloud is some stuff comes for free. Like, because it's out there running in the cloud and because I'm using a client to connect to it, Collaboration is trivial. All I simply have to do is pass to my colleague the keys to my interactive session, and he can be working in it too. And it's full interactive control, which can be good and it can be bad. <laughs> but the other thing, keep the data in the cloud. Data management is a key part of the, the equation. So we're using multiple AWS components to deliver the solution. As I said, we don't want just dumb file systems. When we save a, a simulation file into the cloud environment, we actually extract metadata that characterizes what was the nature of that simulation. That means I can search and find later what were all the fluid mechanics simulations that I ran in December that used a particular turbulence model, right? And you can so find and reuse your data. And we save that metadata using the RDS service in, in AWS. Uh, and the nice thing is when you, when you use an AWS service, some of that management, painful management stuff that you have to do yourself on on-premise 
comes for free, right? So RDS as a service that you pay for takes care of things like snapshots and backups, right? So the, the IT footprint gets lightened. Uh, we're using EBS for the work in progress data. We're actually, we've configured a couple of instances with EBS volumes for in, in a cluster file system um, using ClusterFS. And it's taken quite a bit of, inf uh, of information, of, of, of engineering, I should say, rather, to get the performance to behave itself. We had to use the right instance types. You know, in the early stages, we had some kind of gating instances that were slowing us down that we were using. Um, it took, took a fair bit of tweaking to get this working. Uh, we are using SSD, so now we're getting very good performance, which is critical. Um, when we save data to the system for long-term use, we extract the metadata. That goes in the RDS database. The big files, the heavy files, are actually saved in S3. And there, again, what you have is extremely low cost, extremely reliable, extremely durable. Um, essentially, you don't need a backup solution because S3 is extremely reliable and extremely durable. So, um, and we get good performance with, mul with multi-part upload. So that's kind of the three components of the, of, of the storage system. And then finally, we've got to be able to deploy it. We can deploy the full solution in a dedicated customer account. So this is something we do for the customer in their account. Obviously, we use CloudFormation templates with parameters and Lambda features so that we can customize the deployment to match the customer's need. Things like what, what instance types do they need in, in what HPC queues because they're running particular solvers, how much storage do they need. Um, and actually taking a step back, what's interesting looking ahead is I think I will see a move more and more to um, scalable services rather than instance-based systems that we're deploying. Um, we have quite a bit of persistent infrastructure that runs all the time to manage this system. Looking ahead, it'll be nice to move things, move off of you know, RDS, which requires an instance, on to something like Aurora, which is a service. And similarly, we're really interested in, in what EFS might bring to the system instead of EVS, because then we don't have to pre-configure the storage. It'll just get as big as you need. So there's lots of fun. Um, and, you know, they always say cloud isn't, isn't, a, isn't a destination, it's a journey, and we're having fun on the journey. So, um, like I said, we use cloud formation templates. Cycle Cloud automates some of the deployment of that elastic infrastructure using Chef. We do the full deployment in less than three hours, which in a cloud group sounds like forever. <laughs> you know, that three hours, what are you kidding me? For us, that's, you know, uh, hallelujah music plays in the graphic background because we're comparing that to deployments that take months to spec, acquire, provision, deploy, and roll out to customers. You know, nine months to a year are not unusual deployment cycles. Um, and then once you've got it deployed in, in hours instead of months, it, it, it elastically scales. So that agility and elasticity uh, genuinely excites us. And we think once our customers start to get their head around it and they get a sense of how quickly they can get access to resources and how scalable those resources are, we're, we're genuinely excited about how much that's gonna be able to change, I think, how people do engineering. So with that, I'm gonna pack, pass back to Tosh for our wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, Judd. So uh, hopefully this was uh, interesting enough for you guys. I think at the, at the I think at the heart of all of this, or the core of all of this is, you know, is, is making the, so we've got a number of building blocks. It's making the right choices with those building blocks and architecting a system uh, that's ideal for the cloud and ideal for how users use the system in the cloud as opposed to how they use on-premises. For example, one thing that Judd mentioned was that typically on-premises, it's, it's, it's about uh, scheduling jobs and lining up jobs to fit into a fixed envelope of an infrastructure, while on the cloud, you have a lot, lot more elbow room, so you can actually, uh, the way you schedule, the way you manage that infrastructure is, is very different. So making all of these choices with these building blocks is really where, uh, where, where the essence of a, of a good HPC system on AWS lies. So as you saw, you know, picking the right families of instances, using uh, the right networking services, uh, and also in the end, having a, a, a really solid user experience. Again, keeping in mind that on the cloud, there might be a a slightly different way in which your users might uh, use this capability than how they use on-premises. So having the right interface, the right user interactions, user experience for that is critical. And then making the deployments extremely easy, and which, again, as Judd mentioned, is one of the big value, values to uh, Ansys' customers, is, is the fact that you can very quickly deploy a system. And it's, it's a configuration uh, and an in, an infrastructure that's consistent across deployments. 
which also makes it easier for Ansys as, an, as a software vendor to support these customers because uh, it, it's, cons it's consistent what's underneath. So uh, you don't have issues coming up which are one-off based on very different uh, underlying infrastructure, underlying hardware in, in various deployments. So having easy deployment uh, through using CloudFormation or, or Lambda, for example, is, uh, is extremely important. And the final point, but I, I think a very important point, is you don't have to build this entire system by yourself. Uh, as Ansys did, we have, we have many partners in our ecosystem that specialize in various aspects of HPC and various aspects of the solution that you're building. Uh, in Ansys' case, it was cycle computing and nice software that they uh, collaborated with. So do look through our partner ecosystem and see if there are partners, if there are folks who have expertise in a certain uh, part of the solution, which is not your core differentiator as such. Uh, and you'll actually find that the, the journey to the cloud is, is much quicker uh, with their experience and expertise. So thank you for being here. Again, Thursday morning in Vegas is, is tough, and especially in a, for an HPC session, so I really appreciate, we appreciate uh, you guys being here. And uh, we still have about 10 or so minutes. Uh, we'll be available here, both Jar and I, for any specific questions or queries you might have. But I really encourage you guys to, first of all, uh, please evaluate the session. I, we would love your feedback. So we'd want to know if there was, if you actually found the information valuable, if there's anything else that you would have liked to see. And we would make sure that we, we build better presentations based on your feedback going forward. Uh, but also, please come up and, and talk to us about it. We are more than happy to help you with your uh, HPC journey on the cloud. Uh, here's my email ID. Uh, but there's a number of folks in AWS who are experts in the space who will be more than happy to help you out. So thank you again. And uh, hopefully you have a great rest of your reInvent. Thanks.